Russian Bolsheviks, personified by their leader, Vladimir Lenin, believed that the 1917 revolution had initiated a profound transformation, an advance of the human mind toward realizing their dreams of a communist utopia. The Bolsheviks themselves started out as merely a wing of the Russian Social Democratic Workers' Party, splitting with the Mensheviks, who adhered to a doctrine more consistent with Marx's original vision. In the fall of 1917, after coming to dominate the socialist councils known as Soviets, the Bolsheviks seized the reins of power. Signaling that a new era had begun, the Bolsheviks renamed themselves the Russian Communist Party in early 1918. As a group, the Bolsheviks were both iconoclastic and utopian. They wanted to disinfect Russia of centuries of imperial values. They wanted to remake Russia and Russians. They wanted to create a more advanced version of humanity, modern, socialist, inspiring, and efficient. The Bolsheviks aspired to make this utopian dream a reality by marshalling the power of the Soviet state. The objective was driven by the twin impulses of ideological conviction and the desperate contingencies necessitated by civil war. In practice, revolutionary culture would permeate everyday life. It'd be a part of Soviet citizens' physical environment, habits, and even memories. Our focus today will be that everyday culture. Given Lenin's determination to rapidly transform his country, it's unsurprising that his government quickly alienated a significant section of society. The Bolshevik government's vindictive position toward the former elites antagonized privileged parts of the old regime. Decrees announcing the separation of the state from the Russian Orthodox Church left the devout embittered. Even some less conservative elements of society disdained Bolshevik rule. So, Russians espousing a variety of political beliefs looked forward to the convocation of the freely elected Constituent Assembly, whose members were charged with writing a new constitution. This body, in which the Bolsheviks formed only a minority, was broken up by troops loyal to Lenin only a day after it started to meet in January 1918. The repressive action, along with the closure of the printing presses of various opposition parties, signaled the ideological rigidity that would define much of Soviet rule for the next seven decades. By the time Lenin's party changed its name to the Communist Party in the spring of 1918, its hold on power seemed tenuous at best. For many, the peace treaty that the Soviet government signed with the Germans was the last straw. It's hard to imagine that the terms of the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk could have been worse for Russia. The new Soviet state had to relinquish Ukraine, Poland, and the Baltic states to the Germans. To put this into context, consider the following. 60 million people lived on the territory that passed from Soviet to German hands through the treaty. It was among the most populated and productive regions in the empire. One third of Russia's productive arable lands, one third of its railway system, and almost 70% of its heavy industry was located there. That Trotsky and, and Lenin agreed to such a treaty illustrates not only their desperation for peace, but also their belief that a worldwide socialist revolution was imminent. Whenever the latter occurred, and socialist doctrine promised that it would, national borders would become immaterial. So for Lenin, the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk didn't seem ruinous in the long run. But for the less doctrinally devout, it was a travesty. By the spring of 1918, a civil war was believed preferable to Bolshevik rule by monarchist, former czarist military officers, members of other political parties, and a sundry assortment of other anti-Bolshevik elements. Collectively lumped together as the whites, they lacked any homogeneity beyond their loathing of the Bolsheviks. But now, these white forces engaged the Bolsheviks, renamed the communists in a brutal civil war. Western democracies that formerly had allied with Russia during World War I 
were suspicious of the Bolsheviks' aims for a world revolution and viewed them as a hostile force. Some, including the United States, became involved in the civil conflict that was ripping through Russian society and threatening to undermine Lenin's government. American soldiers fought briefly in Russia as part of two different operations from 1918 to 1919, though foreign military intervention was limited and swiftly withdrawn. Even so, Allied operations bolstered the whites and fueled Bolshevik paranoia, providing evidence, according to the University of North Carolina historian Don Rowley, for Bolshevik depictions of the whites as traitorous agents of imperialist foreign powers. Early in Russia's civil war, which persisted from 1918 to 1920, the Soviets militarized the economy through a program known as war communism. Industries were nationalized, property was seized, and grain was forcibly requisitioned at the end of a gun. Force and compulsion, along with the need for sacrifice on the part of the citizenry, defined this period to a great extent. And even more, force and compulsion became foundational elements of Soviet culture. The Red Army swelled to five million men over the course of the civil conflict. And as these men returned to everyday life, military mannerisms and jargon became ubiquitous in party slogans and the speeches of Soviet leaders. To be fair, the Soviets had inherited a militarized nation with the First World War already underway for several years at the time. Surveillance and propaganda were employed not only in Russia, but also in practically every European state. But unlike much of Europe, the Soviets, given the initial widespread opposition to their rule, would maintain these intrusive wartime habits indefinitely. The Cheka, the Soviet secret police, was the organization charged with surveilling the population so that the state could transform it. The Cheka employed some 60,000 people and an extensive network of informants beyond. The power and pervasiveness of the communist security apparatus grew over the course of the Civil War. By the end of the conflict, no part of Soviet life fell outside of the Cheka's interest. No element of Soviet society was beyond its reach. Originally conceived as a temporary body, it soon became a permanent feature of the Soviet system. It changed its name and leadership, morphing from the Cheka to the State Political Directorate, or GPU, and then to the People's Commissariat for Internal Affairs, or NKVD, under Joseph Stalin. That was followed by the KGB after Stalin's death in 1953. But it's always remained in some manifestation. Meanwhile, with lines blurred between allies and enemies, the Cheka used violence and revolutionary terror to maintain Bolshevik control. The most famous example occurred in a basement room at the Epatiev House in the Eurasian town of Ekaterinburg, about 880 miles or 1,400 kilometers east of Moscow. That's where local Bolsheviks executed the former Emperor Nicholas II, his wife Alexandra, and their five children early on the morning of July 17, 1918. In the words of the British historian Orlando Fegis, Nicholas had to die so that Soviet power could live. But the decision came at a critical point in the conflict with white forces. By mid-July, anti-Bolshevik forces were just miles from the deposed monarch. Indeed, white troops captured the town not long after the execution. The Soviet newspaper Izviestia announced Nicholas II's death the next day. The announcement played loose with the truth, however. No mention was made of the fact that Bolshevik guards had murdered the emperor's family as well. Instead, the article falsely stated that the empress and her son Alexei had been moved to a safe place. Lenin himself must have decided that the entire imperial family must die. But he might have been less confident that the Russian people would share his belief that the Tsar's children shared their father's guilt. Still, only hardened monarchists lamented Nicholas's death. In general, public reaction to the news of the execution was notably subdued 
By now, the revolution had already seen much murder and death. But in retrospect, we can see that the murders of the Romanov family inaugurated a new stage in the civil war and communist rule. The use of violence, even against non-military populations, was now accepted. And even when rumors circulated that the Bolsheviks had murdered the entire family, there was little public comment or discussion, much less outrage. From now on, individuals would count for nothing in the civil war, the historian Orlando Fija says. Although the Soviet state now identified terror as a necessary weapon in the fight against counter-revolution, one problem with the government's analysis is that it never defined the elements of counter-revolution. As a result, virtually anyone could be considered a counter-revolutionary and thus a potential victim of the state crackdown. Arbitrary arrests, imprisonments, and summary executions became common. Human tragedy was almost an everyday experience. To be fair, the socialist revolutionaries, known as the SRs, had also used assassinations and other forms of terrorism against the Tsarist state since the first years of the 20th century. And they turned their violent attention to the communist during the Civil War. The SR's radical ideology focused on the revolutionary potential of the peasants and the countryside. In late August 1918, one of them murdered Mosai Urutsky, the head of the Cheka in the capital. Hours later, another SR, a woman by the name of Fanny Kaplan, shot Vladimir Lenin three times as he emerged from the hammer and sickle factory in Moscow. He was gravely wounded, but he survived. Resistance to the Bolsheviks stemmed, at least in part, from their thoroughness. That's to say, the Bolsheviks aimed not merely for political change, but also to renovate every aspect of life. And this seemed quite threatening to ordinary Russians. But a key weapon for Lenin was propaganda. Soon after the October Revolution, the Bolsheviks closed bourgeois newspapers, appropriated their presses, and seized more than 1,000 newspaper kiosks in cities and railroad stations across the country. The utility of newspapers was limited by the high levels of illiteracy in the Soviet state. Still, the Soviet government itself distributed a half million newspapers each week during the Civil War through its expropriated kiosks. Also, the new medium of radio afforded new propaganda possibilities and state-controlled radio broadcasting would begin in the early 1920s. Film offered further opportunities. All of these projects were overseen by the Bolshevik writer Anatoly Lunacharsky, who became the Commissar for Education and Enlightenment. Lunacharsky's office was colloquially known as Narkompros, and it conducted the culture campaign on behalf of the Soviet state. Nakhampros viewed the country's railways as an important means to reach the population. So propaganda trains crossed the country to bring revolutionary culture to the people. These agit trains for short, from the term agitational, which means to persistently promote a political or social cause, were outfitted with everything the communists needed to reach the masses, libraries, newsstands, and even printing presses. For the illiterate masses, the train's colorful designs, lined with artistic propaganda, attracted and held their attention. Onlookers could hear speeches from fiery orators, listen to phonograph recordings of Lenin, revel in revolutionary-themed skits and plays, and watch silent agitational newsreels and films. Revolutionary posters also became ubiquitous. The posters that hung from street lamps or faced outwards towards the street from storefront windows became a common addition to the Soviet urban landscape. Artists like the Russian painter, topographer, and designer El Lisitsky, who lived from 1890 to 1941, embraced the mission to produce a new abstract visual language suited to the socialist future. One of Lisitsky's most prominent works was called Beat the Whites with the Red Wedge. In this 1920 poster, according to Northwestern University art historian Kathleen Tak, Lisitsky brought art school forms 
onto the street where the red wedge was readily recognizable as corresponding to Red Army Commander Leon Trotsky's metaphor of the wedge of revolution. The American historian Rex Wade points out that red had been the traditional color of revolution since the 19th century. And in the newly established Soviet state, it became the universal symbol of the Russian Revolution. In turn, the presence of red banners, red cockades, red armbands, red ribbons, and red draping speakers, platforms, and other displays transformed Soviet cities and towns. So too did the removal of czarist statues and monuments. A handful of czarist era landmarks with special historic and artistic significance remained, including the Bronze Horseman of St. Petersburg as well as a statue to Catherine the Great, just off Nevsky Prospekt, and another to Nicholas I on St. Isaac's Square. But these were the exceptions. Now, Lenin solicited designs for new statues that would commemorate revolutionary heroes and monuments that celebrated the victory of socialism. The Bolsheviks erected dozens of new monuments to serve as visual aids to legitimize the revolution and educate the urban masses about their history. Early Soviet monuments also celebrated a diverse array of Russian and European radicals, philosophers, and artists, reflecting the Bolshevik conception of the revolution as an international workers' movement. Legendary rebels and members of the intelligentsia were immortalized in plaster, granite, and bronze, as were French revolutionaries, philosophers, and of course, Marx and Engels. The Bolsheviks also realized the power of naming streets, squares, buildings, and cities. Lenin believed that the naming process conveyed legitimacy and prestige. So long before the last battle of the Civil War, streets, squares, buildings, and cities were renamed in this way and running counter to Shakespeare's counsel that names were immaterial. Revolutionary milestones and values became landmarks of Soviet life through the labels which they were bestowed and which became part of the public landscape. For instance, Milionaya Street, on the edge of the former Tsar's Winter Palace, went from being a reference to the level of wealth that had abounded there to Kartornaya Street, named after the revolutionary Stepan Katurin, who bombed the palace in 1880. The Soviets also renamed two streets near the spot where Tsar Alexander II was assassinated in 1881. These would now be known for the radical lovers Sofia Perovskaya and Andrei Zhilyabov, leaders of the People's Will Revolutionary Group, who'd engineered the Tsar's death in March of 1881. And maybe the communists were more romantic than we normally give them credit for. Perovskaya and Zhilyabov streets were just a stone's throw from each other, reuniting the tragic lovers near the spot where they realized their violent plans at least until they were later renamed once more. The power of names to convey values led to a reconsideration of personal names as well. Bolsheviks sought to replace a religious orientation to the world with a rigorously communist and scientific outlook. In particular, this referred to three main events of human life, birth, marriage, and death. So, and quite suddenly, the names Ivan, Alexander, and Nikolai gave way to Vladlin and Ilyich, both after Vladimir Lenin, and also Nino, Lenin spelled backwards. In turn, Ekaterina, Olga, and Alexandra were replaced by Ilina, once again after Vladimir Lenin, Traktorina, to celebrate the technological advances of Soviet agriculture, and Elektrifikatsiya, to honor the modernization of the Soviet Union through the introduction of electricity. But my personal favorite is Mailor, from the first letters of Marx, Engels, Lenin, and October Revolution. The reason that so many variations of Lenin's name were popular has to do not only with the Bolshevik leader's role in the October Revolution, but also with his close brush with death. Fanny Kaplan's assassination attempt in August 1918 elevated Lenin to a highly revered and sympathetic figure. In the weeks that followed, articles and poems filled the Soviet press, eulogizing him as a savior and a martyr. His recovery was depicted as nothing short of miraculous 
And when he reemerged in public, after weeks convalescing from his injuries, he became the focus of increasing esteem. Public adoration was a visible way for citizens to demonstrate their loyalty to the Soviets and to the revolution in the midst of the societal terror that became more indiscriminate and pervasive as the Civil War continued. Lenin himself now became the personification of the Soviet state, and public reverence for him revealed each individual's personal commitment to his values. Lenin, in turn, responded to the public warmth with ever more of himself. He seemed to be everywhere at ceremonies in Moscow in November 1918. He oversaw parades, popped into theaters to make re remarks, and unveiled monuments to the history of the revolution on its one-year anniversary. Lenin's participation in these ceremonies, so soon after nearly dying, affirmed his resilience and the robustness of the revolution. His prestige took on mythic proportions. Lenin and the Communist Party had by now realized that they needed to win the hearts and minds of the Soviet people in a very real way. This became a cultural battle that the state fought on every front possible. Among the most elaborate public displays of the Soviet's triumph and transformative culture over the vanquished autocracy of the czars and the diminished church were public mass commemorations on Red Square. These celebrated important Soviet holidays like the October Revolution, May Day, and at the conclusion of World War II, Victory Day. By shaping a narrative of revolution that culminated with the October Revolution of 1917, according to William and Mary University historian Frederick Corney, the Communist Party was inviting the Soviet public to replace its czarist historical memory with a new revolutionary memory and to share in its revolutionary victory. One stumbling block was that the public had actually played only a very limited role in the Bolshevik seizure of power. By the third anniversary of the October Revolution, however, Lenin and the communists ingeniously found, or more specifically created, their equivalent of France's Bastille Day, that resonant French holiday that denoted the date in July 1789 when Parisian revolutionaries and mutinous troops had overrun the French royal fortress and prison that symbolized to them the tyranny of the Bourbon monarchs. Now, in October 1920, with a cast of more than 6,000 and a live audience of nearly 100,000, the prominent theater director Nikolai Yevrenov recreated the Bolsheviks' overthrow of the post-Tsar provisional government back in early 1917. And now, the production represented the Bolsheviks on a scale and a scope that didn't conform to reality. Even so, the commemoration created a narrative of the revolution that incorporated the people and distilled its essential qualities into a single emblematic event, in Frederick Corney's words, producing a mythology of the revolution that subse subsequently became a critical part of Soviet ritual and culture. Lenin quickly recovered from the attempt on his life in 1918, but his overall health declined in 1922 as he suffered the first in a series of strokes. By 1923, his condition no longer permitted public appearances. Over the course of the next year, Lenin's physical state deteriorated further. He was largely incapacitated and unable to speak. Now, even though the extent of the Bolshevik leader's infirmity was hidden from the general public. His extended illness fueled the cult of Lenin. The less he was able to appear in public, the more he was publicly deified. The popular myth of Lenin was substituted for the actual living, breathing Soviet leader. During this time, Lenin's words became requisite mantras at everything from Communist Party meetings to family gatherings and funerals. Further, as the Soviet state increasingly restricted the Orthodox Church and public religiosity, the cult of Lenin filled this devotional vacuum. Lenin's writings took on the force of dogma in the absence of now outlawed scriptural texts. Viewed more broadly, religious saints were consigned to the corrupt past under the Soviets, and Vladimir Lenin became a 20th century 
secular saint. This veneration assumed cult-like proportions because of the long-standing tradition of valorizing leaders in Russian culture. Like Ivan the Terrible and Peter the Great before him, Lenin was depicted as just and kind toward his people and terrible and merciless towards those who dared exploit them. At the same time, unlike Ivan and Peter, who'd had to share the stage with the Russian Orthodox Church, Lenin was concurrently saint, martyr, prophet, and ruler. As a result, the Lenin cult became even more consuming than earlier ruler cults and became a pervasive part of Soviet culture. The cult of Lenin actually served as a stabilizing force in a country overcome by instability, in the same way that the figure of the czar had once offered the Russian masses the promise of order in the midst of chaos. The figure and spirit of Vladimir Lenin now brought a sense of reassurance in a country torn apart by civil war. The extent to which the Lenin cult embraced religious ritual in order to displace it can be seen in the prevalence of the Lenin corner in Soviet institutions and homes. Icon corners filled with religious icons, imagery, and candles had been ubiquitous before the revolution and the spiritual center of the Russian home. After the revolution, these religious icons were removed and replaced with images of Lenin and placards stating his maxims. Even if a home, factory, school, or workers' club didn't have an official Lenin corner, you could be sure that it would proudly display at least one portrait of him. Now, even as the communists vied with the rightist white army for survival, they also commemorated the revolution. This was intentional. The spectacle of festival and the establishment of practices and ceremonies that would become ritualized enabled the Bolsheviks to involve the masses in more immediate ways than they had been in the October Revolution itself. Through its form and content, the official anniversary celebration of October in November 1918 contrasted the turmoil and chaos of the Civil War with the possibilities of an organized state, according to the historian Corny. Revolutionary commemoration provided an effective forum to forge and solidify revolutionary loyalty and solidarity. When Lenin at last died in January 1924, the nation engaged in a period of massive collective public mourning. Because millions of Russians had perished in the Civil War and the ensuing famine of 1921, the scale and frequency of death didn't permit extended displays of grief and mourning for common citizens. But Lenin's death was a mass exception. The nation stopped to collectively mourn. We now see an interesting transmorgification of the Lenin identity. If previously he'd personified the revolution, it isn't too much of a leap to say that by the time of his death, he personified the new Soviet nation. Viewed this way, reflecting on Lenin as the great leader of October, allowed Soviet citizens to mourn their dead and everything that they'd lost in the process of turning out the autocracy and building socialism. Even more broadly, it allowed the country to collectively sanction the revolution through its grief. For three days in the bitter cold of January 1924, more than a half million people waited in long lines to pay their respects to the former Soviet leader, who now lay in state in Moscow. Joseph Stalin, the man destined to be Lenin's successor, insisted that Lenin's body be embalmed and permanently placed on display in front of the Kremlin. A noted church architect designed a cube-like structure that infused elements of ancient mausoleums to house his remains. You can see a precedent for this in medieval Christian beliefs that the bodies of saints didn't decompose. Under glass, Lenin became a scientifically engineered socialist saint, and both his tomb and mausoleum were shrines to this founder of the Soviet state. 
visiting Lenin became a sort of pilgrimage, both for the socialist faithful and for the curious from around the world. I recently read that scientists believe that they can preserve Lenin's body for centuries more. In art, according to the Northwestern University historian Kathleen Tuck, the father of the Soviet state came to be depicted according to a standard style, creating an archetypal Lenin, often shown with a single arm outstretched or leaning forward from a tribune, who became recognizable from his silhouette alone. The simple, instantly recognizable image of a much lauded figure had roots in Russia's long tradition of icon painting. Just as strict rules applied to the painting of religious icons, Lenin iconography became standard to diverge was sacrilege. Meanwhile, Lenin was alive, not only under glass, but also in propaganda, literature, culture, and history. His life habits epitomized what it meant to be a good communist. His words became gospel. And as prolific a writer as he'd, as he'd been in his 56 years, there seemed to be a saying or adage from him to fit any occasion. In addition, a Lenin naming frenzy began. Schools, farms, libraries, and of course, the former capital of Petrograd now assumed his name. What had been Peter City of St. Petersburg became Leningrad. He was a constant presence and would remain forever alive. This sense that Lenin lived on after his death permeated popular culture in the 1920s. In Soviet fairy tales like Clever Lenin or Ilyich Will Wake Up Soon, his spirit remained both mobile and inquisitive as he left his mausoleum from time to time to check on the progress of socialism. The Russian writer Vladimir Mayakovsky, a leading poet of the revolution, immortalizes Lenin, his ideas and legacy in his work, Komsomolskaya. Mayakovsky writes, Lenin lived, Lenin lives, Lenin will always live.